question. Um, 50, 75. Let's shoot for, uh, let's do 60. Right in between. Okay, 60. Boom, okay. Yeah. Uh, what I do is I read them. This is usually how we go about it. I read them and I'll let you struggle through the answer set. Uh, I apologize in advance to people who are watching this. Uh, you know, we're trying to keep this in a timely fashion. I've had people listening to this on their phone or something and want us to read each and every selection and talk about it. It's more about Erica than it is about you as a viewer. So I apologize, but that will be the way we move forward. The practice to dollar cost averaging, very testable, requires the investor to... Are you there? C. Reading through C. it. What's that? C. <laughs> yeah, what you want to do, let's see where I'm having problems with my one, two. Just a sag, boom. Boom. Hold on just a second. I'm trying to get my. Uh, you said uh, C, buying a security and falling market. No, it's not selling. Uh, the practice to dollar cost averaging requires that you uh, both buy in a rising and a falling market, right? Because you're trying to buy more shares when they're low and less shares when they're high. Does that make sense? Yes, so it sounds like it's A. Yeah, it is uh, indeed uh, A, right? Boom. And then remember the other thing that you get test on Erica is you end up with a lower average cost than those of the underlying shares. So that's the other thing that uh, is uh, about that. Okay, let's go for our next performance opportunity. Doesn't guarantee profit. Which of the following instruments is essentially a letter of credit? Essentially a letter of credit. Okay. Uh, not margin loans. A letter of credit, remember, is where a bank says that uh, if you present this letter of credit, we'll pay you X number of dollars. So that's not about a margin account. Oh, it sounds like it's a, a banker's that's, acceptance. Yeah, that's right. Remember, banker's acceptances are used to facilitate foreign trade. Yeah. Maximum maturity. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry, I answered the right answer. We're trying to get a bit, bit what you got here, right? Anyways, these are issued at... Uh, a discount and have a 270-day max maturity. Uh, individual using fundamental analysis would be most likely to analyze. Dividend payout ratios. Excellent, excellent, right? You should, I would have used process of elimination on this. You are correct. B is nothing that we've ever talked about. It's not a test answer, right? Trading volume is about technical analysis and moving averages is about technical analysis. So excellent. I uh, I guess it's okay. I usually we score it at the end, but I guess we could score this as we go along. Go along so uh, a customer sells short a thousand shares at 60. Three months later, XYZ is at 44. Which two of the following strategies, which two of the following strategies are most likely the customer used to protect her unrealized gain? I like this one. When you sell short, you have to buy for protection. So you buy a call. Excellent, excellent. So now you got a 50-50, you need three. You need a choice to buy back the borrowed stock. So excellent. I'm going to go with sell stock. No, you already sold it. So it would be the buy stop, right? You'd put a buy stop to protect the profit in a short position. So it's buy the call. You got the call right. You got the call right. Then you're going to enter a buy stop above the market, right? So sell stop is to protect a long stock position. So short stock is going to be a buy stop or buy a call. It's two and it's three. All right. 
You're just on the wrong side of where that, that question is. A uh, six-year-old customer wishes an investment, wishes an investment, <laughs> kind of, Kaplan grammar is kind of funny, wishes an investment that can provide for retirement needs while adjusting for changes as aging takes place would probably find which of the following investments the most suitable. Um, you're adjusting. So I would think a target date fund. Excellent. 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 That's exactly correct. That's exactly correct. Oh, you know, these long ones you go, oh my God. A corporation has an outstanding issue of an 8% convertible debenture with a conversion price of 25. What have I said over and over and over again about when you get a conversion price? Better get that ratio. That's exactly right, right? So the bond indenture contains an anti-dilutive clause guaranteeing that the debt holders have the right to maintain proportion ownership in conversion. So company pays a 10% stock dividend. It's common shareholders. How will that affect the debenture holders? So how are you going to proceed on this one? Um, I'm going to work out the ratio first. That's exactly what you should do. So you're going to take a thousand. You're going to divide by 25, which is 40. There you go. And so now that was the proportion I was going to get before the 10% stock dividend. So now we're going to take the 10% times 40 to figure out how many more shares we're going to get. So when you do that, how many more shares are we going to get? Four. Okay, so now we get 44 shares. And so now how are we going to get the new conversion price? We're going to take par and we're going to divide it by? 44. And hopefully that's one of these answers. Yeah, 2272, but you have to round up. So. Yeah, yeah. And By the way, that will not have a problem, Erica. Rounding on your calculator will never be the difference between a right and a wrong answer, right? So, so excellent. That's exactly right. You just go with whatever you're the LED display says, right? Uh, all the following statements regarding Fannie Mae are true except. So one of these things is false. One of these things is false about Ginny Mae. One of these things is false about Ginny Mae. B. Uh, interest on Fannie Mae's is taxable at all levels. No, that is true. Did you say B? I did, but I regret it. Yeah, no, but remember, all these agency securities are fully taxable. Uh, the thing that is not true is Fannie Mae is not owned by the U.S. government. Done. Okay. I wouldn't worry about Fannie Mae. The one you're going to get tested on is Ginnie Mae, and you definitely need to know that Ginnie Mae has the full faith and credit of the United States government, pays interest in principal monthly, and is fully taxable. So I wouldn't worry about Fannie Mae on your exam. Don't worry about Ginny Mae. All the following are an objective of a call writer except, a call writer except. Hey. A uh, covered call. Well, well, yeah, there you go. So it's a covered call. So what's your answer? Hey. All the following are suitable objectives for a call writer, except speculating the stock will not rise. Well, you are speculating that the stock will not rise past the strike price. So I do think this is a good miss on your part because you're usually you're hedging. But let's look at these other ones. Uh, providing downside protection for a long stock position. Well, you are going to bring in some premium and that will lower your out-of-pocket cost. Profiting from an increase in the price of the stock. Yes, you profit from the price you paid and the price you agree to sell at the strike price. And increasing your return on a long stock position. So here you do this all of the following, except you don't participate past the strike price, right? So you're not speculating that the stock will not rise in price. That's something you are thinking it's not going to do. I think this is a very poorly worded question. 
And I don't think I would worry too much about it because what you're going to get asked is your point, right? Covered call rise don't increase. So once you go past that strike, you don't participate. I think that's on Kaplan. I don't think that's on you. An investor in which of the following products may not receive uh, dividends. So one of these things does not pay dividends. Gosh, I'm torn between A and D, <clears throat> but I don't recall. Okay, of so I like that. You got a 50 50. You're correct. It is either oil and gas, limited partnership interest that don't pay dividends, or UITs that don't pay dividend unit investment trust. You're correct. The preferred stock and common stock does indeed pay dividends. So I'm going to take a chance, Erica. I'm going to ask what is your flash response to this question? What is the one that first struck you as potentially being the right answer? The partnership. And you are correct. So please trust your first inclination. As a okay. test taker, usually your flash response is indeed your best response. And so, you know, one of the things is, you're, you know, we've had a, as you've matriculated through your SIE and got that victory, and now you're in a second victor, uh, testing victory working on that. I know you well enough, I think, that I can say this to you uh, without hurting your feelings. Uh, you know way, way more than I think you give your credit, you give yourself credit for sometimes because you've worked really, really hard. So uh, I don't want you second guessing yourself on your exam. Your flash response is usually going to be your best response. You just need to, you know, click that button, aim and shoot, point and click and move on to your next performance opportunity. Now, I would have been a little upset if I asked you what your flash response was and you said UIT. Now, remember, UIT is a unit investment trust. And that's a fixed portfolio of professionally selected assets, passively managed. And it will pass through, like a mutual fund, dividends to its uh, owners. So good job. Good job. Remember, uh, partnerships, what you get in partnerships, Erica, is distributions. Right? You get a flow through of the distributions. You don't get dividends. You don't get dividends. You're getting a return of your own money coming back to you is what's happening in a partnership. Automatic exercise will occur for options, equity options at expiration that are in the money by at least. I'm gonna have to assign this to, me, to the universe. <laughs> okay, so if you're gonna assign to the universe, again, what does Dean say? If you're assigning to the universe, what should you pick if you're gonna assign something to the universe? Choose B, assign it to Yeah, B, right? There you go, you got it right. <laughs> <laughs> so, now remember we, we we only do that as a last kind of uh, you know, thing but yeah you got to give yourself permission to do that now I, I haven't asked you what your practice test scores have been uh you know hopefully you're in abundance where you can do more of that right and there's no uh -huh. sense to be honest with you if you don't know something like this, this is a recognition question you don't miss it don't know it there's no sense in burning up a bunch of brain cells and time on it you just should do that i mean you really because you 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 don't want to be stuck in something like this for, you know, why you could be using it, you know, beyond word and upward, so to speak. Anyways, the bigger uh, test issue, the bigger test issue about automatic exercise is not so much this question, but rather that the OCC does it on a randomly on a random basis. And then the broker dealer can do it random five or another fair method. Right. And then, you know, the customer has to deliver either the money or the stock. And uh, it has uh, the exercise is T plus two. I would definitely know that if the contract has intrinsic value, it will be exercised. Uh, during a, per, a period of sustained low interest rates, many investors, particularly institutions, look to increase their return through alternative debt instruments. Examples of these would include all the following except, I kind of like this again, this is what we call the Sesame Street trick. One of these is not a debt interest a debt instrument. The other three are. So which one is not a debt instrument? Which one do you, Erica, as an investor, not have credit risk? The private placement debt. 
No, if it's private placement of debt, these are the bonds that uh, were sold to uh, take Twitter private. Those uh, bonds have a, like a 10% coupon. They were sold to institutional investors. And it is a potential uh, outcome that Twitter defaults. You know, Elon has said he, you know, he would consider bankruptcy at some point for Twitter. Uh-oh. So exchange traded notes, the test question, exchange traded notes are definitely dead instruments. That's very testable. Yeah. ETFs are not. ETFs are not. Exchange traded yeah. funds, you actually have a custodian who is holding the underlying assets. And private placement debt, we just talked about that. Equity link notes, indeed. So notes, debt notes, it's, ET, it's ETFs. ETFs are not a debt center. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, Erica, except to know, really make sure you know the exchange traded notes test question are debt instruments. That's the major takeaway from this question is to know that ETNs are as well as ELN. So the key word there is notes. Okay. Uh, before the filing of a registration statement for a new issue. Sure. Was? Are you guys um, okay, Eric? You got some background noise there. You want me? Oh, sorry. There you go. All right. So uh, one, three, three. Uh, before the filing of a registration statement, so that means we're not in the cooling off period. We're not in the cooling off period yet. That's what that means in plain English. You may not. You may not. So they're asking you what you can't do before the filing of a registration statement. So can you solicit indications of interest for the security? Yes or no. Can you solicit orders? Yes or no. Can you confirm the sale of security to a customer? Yes or no. Are you allowed to do any of these things before the issuer has filed a registration statement? Hey. Right on. Good job. By the way, you, we picked, you uh, asked to go over regulatory questions and we did the custom quiz on that, and that's where this question is coming from, and it's a good question. So, I get I, I get a little aggravated, Erica, with people saying that you know people don't have questions that reflect the actual exam. Uh, I'll probably regret saying this in a recorded thing, but years ago, the predecessor company to Kaplan was a company called Dearborn, and Dearborn got so close to the Series Seven, the Fenner said that's too close, <laughs> paid a six-figure fine for copyright infringement. So. I got a little too close to some of the questions. Anyways, a customer opening a margin account must be supplied with a special margin risk disclosure. Now, sometimes that happens. So here, they've accidentally told me something that I may or may not have known. Now I know that that is true, and maybe who knows? Maybe now down the road, maybe I can use that to answer some other questions. Which of the following are specific risks disclosed? So uh, customers are not entitled to choose which securities can be sold if a maintenance call is not met. So does this document tell you that Erica, we, the broker dealer, decide which securities will be sold to meet a maintenance call? Yes or no. Customers can lose more money than the initially deposited. Yes or no. Customers are not entitled to an extension of credit, extension of time to meet the margin call. Yes or no. Firms can increase their in-house margin requirements without advance notice. So your answer would be uh, in this disclosure document, which of these are we going to disclose to the customer? Oh, you're on mute, Erica. I can't hear you. Um, I think customers can choose what securities they want sold. They just need to make sure they meet that, that maintenance. No, 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 because they, you know, they're emotionally attached to that. Then no, we tell, we choose. Mm -hmm. We choose. You don't get to choose because, you know, what you're going to want to sell is not the one that's got you in trouble. I say, Erica, and if you check your disclosure document, we decide what security will be liquidated. By the way, it's going to be the one that's giving you the biggest problem, right? Because that's the one will make the problem go bye-bye, hopefully. So uh, you don't get to choose. So that means one is a part of it. So now that I've told you that one is a part of it, that means your answer now becomes either A or D. Well, it's D because I like two. There you go. In a discussion with one of your customers, the topic of alternative debt instruments is brought up. It seems that the customer was competing in a duplicate bridge tournament in town. And one of the other competitors mentioned they are obtaining higher income returns from equity linked notes. When the customer asks you for the meaning of that abbreviation, oh, I just, I'm sorry, I gave it away. 
<laughs> for that abbreviation, you would reply. <laughs> now, the reason I gave it away is one of the things I recommend to test takers is when you get an acronym that you just spell it out. Mm -hmm. So that when they give you something like that. And so that was just practicing what I preached there. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, I think, let me see what Kaplan gave you as uh, other choices. Equity leverage notes, no. Equity leverage notes, equity, you know, it's equity uh, linked notes, right? Uh, kind of stupid. Uh, all the following uh, issue securities under the farm credit system, uh, farm credit system, except. Uh, I wouldn't worry at all about the farm credit system as it relates to, you know, passing your, your series uh, seven, but you know, oh well. Well, I'm going to do it again. B. <clears throat> I should have never told you that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, That's why you're the guru. <laughs> well, listen, um, the reason the trick kind of works, did I ever tell you the origins of the B trick? Uh, Brother. <laughs> so, I, I was teaching, I used to teach a weekend three-day class for the cream de la cream of uh, fi American financial educational establishments. These are men and women from Wharton and from Harvard and from Stanford. And, you know, I'd come in for three days to get them ready to go take their series seven. And when I came back from break and I heard this guy, his name was Preston, telling other people that they should guess B. And I teased him unmercifully. I said, how much did we spend on your education? And that's what you learned against me. I'm just teasing him unmercifully. And as you know, I don't know when it's not fun anymore. So, you know, I'm going past the part of where it was funny. Anyways, uh, it, to get their attention, I give them practice questions missing the answer key. Because, you know, I want to get their attention. And so I had it to him. And then the suggested performance opportunities we go over in the morning. And <laughs> I didn't realize I hear him so bad. He came back and he threw the answer key at me. And he goes, Dean, 44% of your answers are B. And uh, he said, Dean, we had to uh, leave it to guys at Harvard to do this. He said, we did a st study of cram courses and we did a study of people who write tests. Those are called psychometrics, people who write tests, you know, and it's called psychometrics, the art of test writing. And they know that cram courses tell people to guess C. And so they statistically, as test writers, shy away from C because they don't want people guessing C and getting the right answer just because of that C trick. And so C used to be your best guess, but now it's B. Now you got to take things like that on faith, you know. But everything I've uh, sensed, when I have absolutely no clue, uh, we do that. So you're two for two. I did a series six class one time where the uh, lady in class literally used the guess be a saint in the universe, and she was right like ten of eleven times. I had to tell her, listen, no, you've got to learn the information. That will not help you pass the exam. <laughs> so you are two for two in the guess be a saint of the universe category. <laughs> A uh, municipality has pre-refunded a bond issue maturing in uh, five years. So you know what that means is they've actually got the money they need once the bonds have passed their call protection to call the bonds. That's what that means in, in English. Uh, this would mean all the following except. This would mean all of the following except. A higher rating. The bonds will be called in more than 90 days. A reduction to the coupon rate. Greater marketability. A higher rating. Well, no, that is going to be a higher rating on the outstanding bonds because they actually owe the money and they have the bond. So pre-refunded bonds are AAA, right? If you own pre-refunded bonds, I call you and I say, Erica, you know the bonds you bought? You go, God, Dean, I love the bonds. Interest rates have gone oh, down. It's, it's a C because the coupon rate never changes. There you Got go. It. That's what they're getting at in that question, right? By, by the way, what you want to do is exactly that, Erica. Look through the, the questions that say, is this really uh, as difficult a question as perhaps it looks? I know the coupon rate or nominal yield never changes. C, thank you very much, right? So now the other things are true, right? Higher rating, the bonds will be called in uh, more than 90 days. We know the bonds, the old bonds are getting called and they're now easier to sell because of the higher rating. Good job. You should definitely know nominal yield doesn't change. So excellent. Reinvestment risk, reinvestment risk, is the chance that after purchasing a bond, interest rates go. So when are you confront, confronted with interest rate risk? When they rise. Well, not when they rise, right? Because if they're rising, as you uh, your bonds mature, you'd be getting higher rates. Well, it's when they fall. It's, That's it's right. when you're you you the same, the yeah, same you amount. Say, hey, yeah, we can't get you that same high rate of return that we used to be able to get you. Right? Got it. So mm -hmm. it's when they fall. 
And remember, you also have call risk in a falling interest rate environment. Uh, what bonds have no reinvestment risk? What bonds, test question, have no reinvestment risk? Zeros. Excellent, excellent. Now, you remember, you're going to get some of those questions like that where you're just going to even shoot point and click. You got it, right? So excellent. And then remember, treasury bonds are not callable either. A mutual fund invested in bonds with medium length maturities. As the bonds matured, the fund reinvested the proceeds and purchased long-term bonds with maturities up to 20 years. What might have happened to the fund if the reinvestment uh, had occurred during a period of when interest rates were rising? Wow, this is kind of a tough one. Uh, decrease in yield, decrease in income, increase in yield, increase in income. So this is a question about the portfolio of a bond mutual fund. You know, I would, what I would probably do in these kind of questions, Erica, is try and put myself into the question and say, okay, so I own a bond portfolio and my bonds are maturing. As they do so, I'm buying bonds that have uh, longer term bonds with maturity up to 20 years. So, hmm, long term bonds typically pay more or less than medium term bonds. Long term bonds pay typically more or less. Less. No, long-term bonds always pay more because you're taking greater interest rate risk, right? So oh. longer-term bonds are typically going to pay you more than shorter term or medium term. And then it says interest rates were rising. So that means the new bonds I'm buying have a higher coupon, a higher nominal yield. Okay. Right on. Right, so... Yeah. That was a tough one. That's a judgment question. You know, we have those recognition questions. You just nailed a recognition question one a couple back. We have practical application. I don't think we've seen any practical application yet. Oh, we had one practical application. We had to adjust the conversion ratio and thereby the, by the conversion price. And this is a judgment questions. And I think those are the toughest ones, the judgment questions. Uh, before affecting a penny stock transaction, the member firm must, the member firm must. Penny stocks are very testable. I can't imagine you're going to have any draw in which you don't get asked about penny stocks. A. Before affecting a penny stock transaction with a customer, the firm must receive the signed copy of the risk disclosure document. Uh, that is not true. We do want to get that back in time but it's where we have to give them both the bid and the ask. We're gonna provide the customer with the bid and the ask so he can see the spread. What is, what is a penny stop? What is a penny stop? Uh, stock that trades under $5. Yeah, I gotta be a little tighter than that. Non-NASDAQ OTC stock indeed. And then I have to give you the disclosure document for your first three transactions. And then after that, you're considered a consenting adult that you know what you're doing. Uh, how often do I have to give you a statement if you have a penny stock in your account? Monthly. Right on. Good job. During the cooling off period, which is a minimum of, what's the minimum for a cooling off period? 20 days. Right on. During the cooling off period of a new issues registration with the SEC, a preliminary prospectus, also known as a red herring, may be sent to prospective investors. That is indeed true. The document would not include. So what does the preliminary prospectus not include? Hey. Not A, this was a bad miss. This was a bad miss. You sh should definitely know that the preliminary prospectus does not include the final offering price. We're going to have See, every... The price doesn't say final. doesn't it have... Um... Well, the offering price, we the offering price. Don't you know? ask the question to do more than it does. It has everything the final prospectus is going to have. Everything you need to make an informed decision except the offering price. 
So everything that you need to make an informed decision, what they plan on doing with the proceeds, you should have definitely know B is not true. You should have been able to toss that right out, right? Because we accept indications of interest, which are non-binding and then pertinent information. So yeah, so that was a bad miss. Uh, that's okay though. Just don't miss it on the test, right? Just don't miss it on the test. Okay. A customer purchased five, uh, six and a quarter U.S. Treasury notes at 98 and 0.24. How much would the customer receive on each interest payment date? All right, so here's a practical application question. Here's a practical application question. We had a recognition question, and now we have practical application. So how are you going to proceed? What, what do you think you should do here to kind of get this answer? Uh, I'm going to start with dividing 24 by 32. Now, you see, you, you, this is where I told you, you worked pretty hard, but be careful what you're being asked. It didn't ask you about the price you're going to pay. The 98 from 24, 30 seconds is not meaningful in this question because they're asking you how much you're going to receive in interest, right? So the number that's relevant is the six and a quarter, not the 98. So now we need to find out what is that going to be in terms of interest, right? So the way we're going to do that is we're going to take our par, we're going to times it by 6.25%. And that's going to be what it pays annually. I'm doing per bond, right? So we're going to take 1,000 times 6.25%. That's 62.50. Uh-oh. Right, and that's an annual interest. So let's put that there. And how do bonds pay? How do bonds pay? Oh man, this is a double bad math. They pay, they they pay, pay through my annually. Right, right okay. on. So now we got to. So now we got to take our. There's a lot of ways to do math, which is kind of the challenge. But now we're going to take our sixty-two fifty, and we're going to divide that by two to represent that we're going to get two checks. Right. And that means each of the interest checks we're going to get per bond. So we're doing per bonds. So we've got to remind ourselves that we're doing two, bar, two bonds. So 62.50 divided by two means we're going to get 31.25. Times five. There you go. And let's hope that's one of our answers. When you're doing math, that's kind of what you want to hope is that, you know, you do the math and then it's one of the answers. Because if not, you know, then we got to go back and say, okay, what she, okay, we must have done something wrong. Times five bonds. I get 156.25. Is that what you get? That's what I get. Okay, let's see. We got it right. Whoop. Ding, ding, ding. Now, we, we hope, we, be careful though. So, you, one thing you want to do is just before you jump in, you know, uh, you know, you worked hard and it shows, right? But you're jumping a little too quick on some of these. So, before you jump on that, you just want to look and say, okay, is that really the, the relevant number? Because that could have been very much what they asked you to do, Erica, is turn that into a dollar price. But that's not what they asked here. So you just got to be careful that, you know, you're answering the question you're being asked and not the question you think is there. I do this all the time, right? I, I think I've answered the question and I go, I go, I, I how did I get that wrong? And I, I answered the question I thought was there rather than the question I was actually asked. So you might just want to, you know, I had a college professor who taught me a great life lesson. You know, uh, it was an essay topic and I, I was clever and I wrote a little introductory paragraph and, you know, he gave me an F and he said, Dean, next time answer the question I asked you, not the question you wanted, wanted to answer. You know, ooh, you know, so now, now as a test taker, I'm a little more careful just to, you know, review what a time and say, okay, did I answer that question? Did this, is this the question I was indeed being asked? So just be careful on that, particularly because you've worked hard. So sometimes you're, you know, you're jumping on what, what you know, there's been an issue in your study effort. Uh, you know, which, you know, so I'm, I'm glad that you, you've done the work to do that. If you, if you hadn't done the work, you wouldn't fall prey to that because you wouldn't know, right? So <laughs> revenue bonds may be called for all the following reasons, except revenue bonds may be called for all the following reasons, except. Revenues don't have debt limits. Geo. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Look at you. So what is, what's your answer based on that? You're absolutely correct. B. Excellent. That was awesome. That was a judgment question. Yeah, it was excellent. 
If I were in charge, I would have given you more than one point for that one. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have given you two or three for that one. That was a good one. Okay, I like this one. So this is a little odd. It's different than other things. Uh, a quote of 2.20 bid, 2.18 offered, would most likely be the quote of a... Well, my gosh. I, I think I would proceed with the Sesame Street trick here. One of these things is not like the other. Yeah, it's got to be B because everything else is a bond. Right on. Now, are you saying it using Sesame Street or are you using B <laughs> assigned it to the universe? Doing Sesame Street on the bond. <laughs> Right, the T-bills are the only ones that are like that. So it looks odd. It says, man, it looks like I buy it at 220 and I sell it at 2.818. I lose two on every transaction, make it up in volume. No, that's a 2.2 discount from face and a 2.18 discount from face. And that's a T-bill. That is a T-bill. All the following records must be retained for three years, except, you know, you we loaded this by way of reminder. You wanted to put some regulatory questions in there, and record retention is certainly one of, one of those. And the vast majority of brokerage firm records are three years. So one of these things is not a three-year record. One of these things is a six-year record. Oh, account statements are six years. Yeah, that makes sense because statute of limitations six. It makes a lot of sense that it's a six-year record. We don't want to go into an arbitration case and, you know, the customer has records that we don't have, right? Uh, and if a general interest rate is increased, the interest income on an open-end bond fund would do which of the following? So what happens to the NAV of a bond fund when interest rates go up? And oh, excuse me. I almost fell prey to the thing I told you not to do. I was just about to say the NAV goes down. But then, Eric, I looked at the question again and they didn't ask us about the NAV. I'll tell you, Kaplan jerks are bigger jerks than the real jerks. Right. So, if general interest rates increase, what we expect right. bonds to do. C. Are you guessing B and assigning to the universe or? <laughs> I should write that the guy who's in charge of this, this cube, you know, okay. by the way, it's mostly guys who write test questions who don't like the tricks. And I think it's because they get aggravated, Erica, that they work like my friend, Brian. He is a self also prey to too long to be wrong. I can't tell you how many of his questions you can get by just looking at it and going, oh man, that must be the one Brian likes because it's got a lot of verbiage there. You know, again, we don't use tricks unless all else fails. Uh, it would be fair and equitable for a brokerage firm to assign an option exercise notice to a customer. Very test will know how brokerage firms can assign exercise notices to customers. And basically what we're saying here is three of these things are not equitable. And one of these things is. D, uh, the excellent. oldest goes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, by the way, a test taking trick, it had to be B or D because they say opposite things, right? So when you look at this answer set, it's, I wouldn't even have burned up brain cells on A and C as a test taker, right? Because when I look at the answer set, I say it's got to be B or D because they say exact opposite things. That's my principle of mutual exclusion test taking trick, Erica. You know, the mm -hmm. illustration I usually use is Socrates is a dog. Socrates is a philosopher. He's either a dog or a philosopher because he can't be both, right? So I would have used uh, the trick to get to that to 50 50. You're correct. The other way the firm could do it is random, mm -hmm. right? Random, FIFO, or another fair method. Now, these others here are not a fair methods, they're discriminatory. Uh, and so oh, Dean, when, yeah. hmm? when, is it, when is it random? When is it fair? And when is it oldest? Well, there's the, the FIFO shows up in options. 
It's the only time it's, well, FIFO shows up two places here, and then it shows up for share identification. If you can't do share identification, the IRS is going to pose up on you FIFO. First shares you bought, first shares you're selling. LIFO, Erica, shows up on the exams. It relates to distributions from an annuity. When you're getting distributions from annuities, it's going to be last money's in, our first money's out. Right? Is that the question you're asking me? I'm not sure if that's the question you're asking me. But... Uh, that works. Okay. So, you know, that's going to be it. It's not, that's never going to be on the other. All right. So it's a U.S. company. That's key. It's a U.S. company. And uh, they're selling stereo equipment or, and they order it from Japan. So these are going to be Japanese stereos. Boy, this brings back memories for me. I'm the old dude. I bought a, I don't even know if they're around anymore, a Sanyo and it had a eight track and a cassette and a turntable. And I just thought that thing was. Hey, I've heard of Sanyo. <laughs> wow. So, you know, I love that thing. Anyways, payment is going to be made in Japanese yen in three months. The U.S. company thinks the U.S. dollar may weaken against the yen. They're giving a lot of information here that, really isn't necessary. And what I mean by that is I kind of know what the, I should know kind of what they're going to be worried about. Which of the following foreign currency option transactions would best protect the U.S. company from a weakening U.S. dollar against the yen? Now, I know the worker that you are, and I know that you know the memory aid device for this. Epic. And that's right. And it stands for exporters by puts. This is not an exporter. Importers by calls. This is a what? Importer. So they are going to. Importers by calls. We're going to buy calls. Yeah, they're going to buy calls on the Japanese yen, right? Excellent. And so, Dean, how can I figure out what side I'm looking at this? I know the IPEC and then I know the FA. If it would have said a US company, it would have said a Japanese company. So mm, that's what it would be the opposite, right? When it says a Japanese company or European company, if it comes out of the gate at you with the foreign company, then it would be the opposite, right? Okay. So maybe we'll run into one of those. Maybe we'll run into those ones. Let's, let's see. All right, our next one. Uh, which of the following statements regarding non-systematic risk are true? Which of the following non-systematic risk are true? Oh. Let's see, non-systematic that uh, diversifying can reduce the risk, systematic will not. That's correct. So, so which one are you picking? See, what you, what, by the way, when you're doing your test, exact same thing, Erica, right? What you said, okay. I'm glad you're thinking out loud because that's part of what we want to do. I want to hear what you're thinking. Your thinking is correct. And so now you got to translate it into an answer right so now you got to look at your answer set and say okay based on what i just said to myself which is true which one am mm -hmm. i picking and it says which of the following statements regarding non-systematic risk are true so they're asking you about selection risk here so three is included in my answer i'm just going between you're, you're one. correct you're correct three is so now you got a 50 50 it's either choice a or choice c Same as market risk. I'm going to go with two and three. Well, you, you missed it because two and four are systematic risk. Two and four are systematic risk. One and three are selection risk, right? Number one, you pick the wrong stock. That's what that's saying in plain English. It's a risk you buy the wrong stock. The yeah. easy way to avoid that is to buy more than one stock. So it's one and three, one and three. Now, this is a good answer set, by the way. You won't get any multiples on your actual exam, but I like this because if it would have said which of the following regarding systematic risk is true, then it would have been the opposite. It would have been two and four, right? Okay. I like how you're proceeding as a test taker. You're proceeding on the right basis. Like, okay, let me get this, see what I can get done on this, you know, lever your way into, you know, a better chance, a better odd, so to speak, of getting the right question. All right, all the following have an impact on the markability of a block of municipal bonds, except. So uh, one of these things doesn't affect your ability to buy or sell the bond. And the, the, other three, 
Right on. Good job. Love it. I love it. I know what I know, Dean. <laughs> yeah, no, like I've been listening. That's why I think I think that's great. That comes from the work you've done. So, you know, you're entitled to get all those uh, aim and shoot point clicks that you worked hard for. Uh, and again, that's other. T- I worry that you might get those too quick, and then you have more time to overthink other ones. I'm joking. <laughs> So, or, you know, don't, don't get to, you know, sometimes you can work so hard, Erica, that you can go, oh my God, it can't be that easy. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, know, you can't squeeze the trigger. All right. A limited partner invests a hundred thousand. Oh, I so enjoy doing these things uh, with you because it brings back so many, many memories. One of my favorite uh, things I got people involved with are partnerships to finance movies. So, you know, we have a general partner who's going to make a movie and then we go find limited partners. So uh, limited partners invest 100,000 in movie production limited partnership with a non-recourse note for 300. So now what that means is uh, you, you're the limited partner, you're investing $400,000. And uh, you're telling me that I can borrow $300,000 on your behalf, Erica, but you're telling me that if the partnership can't pay back the 300 grand, that loan, the bank cannot come after you. So now the partnership liquidates and you receive 100,000. So the loss for tax purposes, what they're testing you on is what is your cost basis in this partnership? Because if it's 100,000, you uh, didn't lose any money because you, you know, invested 100 and you got 100 back. But if you're gonna tell me that the cost basis is 400,000, then you have a $300,000 loss. So what we're asking you is, does that $300,000 add to your cost base, making the answer C, or does that $300,000 not add to your cost basis, making your answer D, because you invested 100 and you have back 100? Hmm. I'm going to say, gosh, I can't imagine the IRS just letting you skate away with <laughs> Well, well, no, remember you, you didn't skate away because you didn't make any money here. You put up a hundred and you got a hundred, right? You didn't make no money. They, you know, we liquidate, I give you back your hundred. It could have been worse there. Okay. Could have lost some money, right? The non-recourse note does not add to your cost base for that to be a $400,000 investment. You have to tell me that if the partnership can't pay back the loan, the bank can come after you. Mm, okay. Uh, by the way, I think this is more of a test prep vendor question than an actual question. Uh, I made a whole podcast episode on legacy questions. They used to really ask a, a lot more kind of questions like this than they do now. I would be surprised to get more than two or three partnership questions, mostly about the flow through and a general partner and the various types we have. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. You know, spend your time on options and mutual funds and muni bonds, other stuff. When determining okay. position limits, position limits. So you're only allowed to have so many uh, contracts on the same side of the market on the same side of the market. I have a uh, uh, explication request to go over a question I think is pretty good based on this. B. Uh, B, you're correct. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I wasn't assigning it, this one I actually missed. Okay, okay. <laughs> it is weird, it is kind of weird. I, you know, I'm, I, we did get a lot of Bs in this thing for some reason. <laughs> I've been telling Kat Gap what I think they should do is make it so these answer sets rotate so you can't just go through them and we go, oh, I remember that one, it's B, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, other thing I think they should do would be really cool is uh, tell you how many candidates get it right or wrong. So, you know, you could say, well, you know, if it says, for example, 90% of people got this right, you go, whoo, I guess I should have got that right. <laughs> it says 10% of the people get it right, then you can go, ah, who cares? <laughs> Probably the most significant difference between a business development corporation in any other investment company registered in the Investment Company Act of 1940 is a business development corporation. This is on the test and it hurts my heart when you know we tell people things are on the test and then they still on debrief say, nobody ever told me about this. And I feel like saying, no, it was in your Kaplan Q Bank. I, you know, on live streams tell you, you that somebody saw it. And so, uh, you know, here we go. So uh, we're asking you the difference between this and, uh, you know, a mutual fund.
Yeah, these are kind of like venture capital firms. What I mean by that, some of them trade on New York and they do um, intervene or help the portfolio companies. They actually, you can say, hey, how can we help you besides providing financing to you? Mutual funds do not provide financing or managerial help to their portfolio companies, right? The Fidelity Fund doesn't call up one of its portfolio companies and say, hey, do you need some help? We'll send some human capital over to help you out. So the answer is, <laughs> hey, hey. Oh. Yeah, so that one's a, that was a tough one, but you will get BDCs. I would think of it as a, like a cross between a mutual fund and a you know venture capital kind of a, a fund, right? So all of the registers are passive investors. They take an active role. They help the small companies. They pass through, right? So you're going to get at least a question on those. All right, investor purchased a thousand shares of Plex at 153. Uh, so that's your cost basis. That's simply when you turned your money into this investment. And shortly afterwards, you uh, sell it for $149 uh, per share. Uh, a purchase of 10 PLX, 150 foot at four takes place. What is the investor's break even? Uh, I, I like this. Kaplan, Kaplan is baiting you into, once again, trying to answer a question that you were not asked. You know, that you were not asked, right? So here, we got to be careful of the wash sale rule, right? So it looks like uh, when we bought the puts, let's see, a purchase of the puts takes place. So I I'm just, D. you got D and you are correct. Excellent. Actually, way perfect. ahead of me. That's great. Okay. I was still trying to figure out how we were going to best proceed in answering the question. You already got it answered. I still want to hear your work through because just because I got it right. I uh, well, I was first going to try and figure out, you know, again, I, you know, uh, I was going to figure out if I interrupted the holding period here, and it looks like I have because they got that comma there. Right. So first I was looking to see if there was a period. So I am in the stock, I'm out of the stock and then I buy the put, but then I see it's not a period. It's a comma. So now they're telling me shortly afterward with the stock selling at 149, I didn't sell it. I sold it for, and that's going to interrupt the uh, holding period, right? So uh, it's going to be added. So you're correct. The big thing, by the way, is if you, you do this at the same time, the holding stock, holding it would be, be, be the same. So you're way ahead. I was still trying to figure out what I'm going to do, and you, you were done. Let's just see. Uh, 150 cost of the insurance. Yeah, 157. Excellent. So that, you know, that's where Dean gets paralysis by analysis, right? You're doing the aim and shoot point click and I'm still thinking, okay, <laughs> you know, what are we going to do here? <laughs> you know, so, um, inform, investor information about the financial condition of a municipality uh, would be most likely found in. Investor information about financial, financial condition. Of a municipal issuer is most likely found in. It's not in the legal opinion, so I can mark that one off. Uh, this, I love it. That's correct. The process of elimination, you're correct. That is not part of your answer set. You are correct. I'm going to go with the official notice of sale. Yeah, no, the notice of sale is published in the bond buyer saying, hey, investment bankers, we're looking for help. It doesn't tell you anything about the city or the county that's raising the money. I always get these mixed up. It's, it's the, the official, official statement. statement. Yeah, um, remember, that's the prospectus-like document when selling bonds. The prospectus-like document when selling municipal bonds. Oh, okay. So, right? The legal pain is very testable, done by the bond council. Bond buyer, very testable. The notice of sale means it's going to be a competitive bid. So, you know, there's going to be some uni questions for sure. For sure. So notice of sale just says, hey, we're selling something. What's that? The so notice of sale is just letting everyone know, hey. Yeah, that's what right. It is. It's like broadcasting, on. hey, investment bankers, we're looking for help. So, and then know, the bond buyer, can you explain that? The, yeah, we published the notice sale in the bond buyer. The bond buyer is a newspaper widely read in the municipal market. Uh, I'm I'm demented, Erica. You know, I have haters. I, you know, I, I maybe had haters all my life and didn't know about it. But now that I'm on social media, I know they're <laughs> out there. And one of the things they get mad is I publish like, I'll, uh, I'll, I read the bond buyer and it has an article that I think might be helpful for people taking their test. You know, it's a very narrow kind of a publication uh, that, you know, if you would if subscribe to if you're municipal finance, and then people get mad at that when I provide the link, I it's not free. I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you about that. I mean, 
<laughs> you know, figure it out. I don't even know if you want to read it. But, uh, you know, they get in charge of a lot of money because, you know, they know that everybody in the municipal finance business is reading this thing. And that's where we're going to publish the no sale. They have articles on what's happening currently and the bond, that, that whole area. Uh, it used to be called the daily bond buyer, right? But uh, it's kind of, I don't know if you're familiar, Erica, probably not if you're, you know, read your Bible, but another kind of publication is called the daily racing form. And the daily racing form is for people who bet on ponies. And so, you know, if you saw me in a coffee shop and having a cup of coffee, reading the daily racing form, you could guarantee that I am somebody who bets on ponies because there's no reason I would otherwise have that. I think of that as the bond buyer. If you see somebody with a copy of the bond buyer, somebody who scribes the bond buyer, they are in the municipal business because there's no other reason you would be subscribing that publication unless you're a demented series seven instructor like, you know, Dean, right? So, but that's what that is. Now that's where we're going to publish the notice of sale. Right. That's how we know because that we know that all the investment banker firms are going to read that thing. So, you know, that's where we're going to publish the notice of sale, meaning it's a competitive deal. So, you know, I think you could, I think it's testable. I think you could see something on the bond buyer. That answer set is very testable. And sometimes I've thought about writing like a, a practice question that just has answers with no questions. And then uh -huh. depending on the answer would, you know, would depend on. It. So that answer set is actually more testable than, than anything else. Right. Uh -huh. All right, so onward and upward. Investors in all the following securities could receive dividend payments at an increased rate over time, except, ooh, I, I get kind of, kind of fun, kind of fun. I think this is another one. If you get it right, I'd give you a couple extra points. At an increased rate. <laughs> yeah, so remember, we you, you kind of nailed a, a similar question earlier when you told me that the nominal yield doesn't change, right? So now we're saying that in these uh, stocks we're looking at, uh, mm -hmm. three of them could have a dividend that changes, and one of them does not have a dividend that will never change. Participating, they they do well. That's they right. Get you get more money. money. You get more money. Wow. So that's right. Same with the common mm -hmm. stock. So you got a 50-50 common stock. Companies do raise their dividends. Bank of America raised it from 18 cents to 21 cents. So it goes up, can go up. Participating preferred lets you participate in excess earnings. So now you got A or B as your two remaining choices. One of them does, one of them does not. So one of these does have a dividend that uh, can increase over time and one of them does not. Adjustable rate. I'm going to go with A. You got it. Right. The adjustable moves against some base rate. So excellent. When reviewing a new customer's investment portfolio, you determine the customer is willing to tolerate a high degree of risk and does not anticipate utilizing the invested funds for at least 15 years. What would be, excuse me, a suitable recommendation regarding asset allocation? for the customer's portfolio, given the customer's risk tolerance and their time horizon. Woo. I don't have an age, but I have the risk tolerance and time horizon. So I'll say high degree of risk. So we can go A. Excellent, so excellent, excellent. Man, I'll tell you, you're right, man. The stuff you're good at, you're good at. So excellent. Uh, regressive taxes, regressive taxes. Gosh, between this and, and progressive, I always jumble the two. Well, let's talk about it. So, you know, um, you know, regressive, I, I think thin taxes, right? Well, regressive taxes are taxes that impact lower income folks more. So, for example, uh, what were you we thinking, Erica? My clients and I financed a restaurant and then, you know, I had to become the uh, you know, managing general partner of this restaurant. What a, oh, what a stupid thing this was. Anyways, I had some of my restaurant staff in San Francisco, you know, the bus boys and servers and stuff, you know, that have to get to work and, you know, it talk, it cost them a lot of gasoline to get back and forth to work. And, you know, a lot of the tax and the gasoline is, you know, buck 50, whatever. And, you know, that impacts lower folks more. So every time they talk about raising a particular tax in this answer set, 
people say, well, gee, I don't think that's going to be fair because it's not meaningful to people who have a lot of money. And it is very meaningful. You know, I, I one time I went into uh, uh, Mel's, a friend of mine, and my, next to my, he has a, a convenience store that was next to my mountain place. And he, he didn't call it welfare. He called it Melfare. You know, <laughs> that he would help people out. And uh, I was surprised because I had bought some milk and there was no sales tax on it. And I said, uh, you know, oh, that's kind of interesting. I have no sales tax. I don't usually just buy a carton of milk. And he said, well, Dean, we don't have sales taxes on dairy products because we don't want young mothers not to be able to buy dairy products. And if you know, if it's a 6% tax and all you have is a dollar and it's a dollar six with the tax, then you can't get it. And so sales taxes are very regressive because they impact lower income folks more. I was in Minnesota and they tell me they don't have a sales tax on clothes because, you know, in the winter, you need to be able to buy, you know, <laughs> parkas and things like that. So progressive are taxes. They get larger as the number gets larger. So the larger your state, the higher the percentage the bigger the gift, the higher the percentage, the more you make, the higher the percentage. So the answer is A. I don't think you'll see that on a seven. I think it's more of like an SIE. So as I told you, you know, our maybe my podcast, I mentioned this. I think that a lot, I call it the chunk theory. People have questions in the Q bank and, and that they keep them there, even though they probably should have reassigned it to the SIE Q bank. Huh. A father opens a custodial account for each of his children with the same mutual fund family. He invests 15,000 in each account. The fund company has breakpoints of 50, 100, and 200. The sales charge is, the sales charge is. Hey. Yeah, excellent. Is there a reason that took you long, that long? <laughs> well, one, I was doing the math, and then I just had to make sure. Okay, the, okay. The oh, that's right. That's fine. fine. That's, that's yeah, fine. The only, reason I, only reason I asked Erica is that for as well as I know how hard you've worked, I, I was expecting yeah. that would have been more of an aim and shoot point and click. There's nothing in here about an invest, investment club or anything like that. So that's yeah. all. No, I, I was doing the math. I had to add the 15 times four. And then okay. I was that's fine. That's fine. I didn't, like I say, as long as you get the right answer, you know, yeah. what, what would be worse is if you spend the time and then you don't get the right answer, right? So, so double I, check it. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's definitely, that's definitely okay. An investor desiring a limited partnership investment with capital gains potential would most likely select one investing in. So one of these things is unlike the other. Shopping centers. Well, shopping centers do have, it says here, capital gains potential. So only one of these does not have an income stream. The two ways you make money is from income and or price appreciation. In a shopping center, we're probably going to be collecting rent. I don't really think we're going to buy shopping centers and flip them. No, we might flip oh. them at the end of the partnership, but we don't typically flip the shopping center until you know we maximize the income out of it. So the answer is raw land. I don't think this is really a big deal on your exam, but raw land, remember, is just, you know, we buy the rant land, we sit on it, and we hope we can sell it to some developer for some big money, right? Not a big deal. So on your partners would want raw land? I don't know much about that sort of investment. Well, that's, that's okay. Yeah, I don't think it's important on your test, but raw land is just, you know, I say, hey, I'm forming a partnership. There's 500 acres on the end of Henderson. It's a former ranch. Well, it's still a ranch, but we're not going to use it as a ranch. We're going to form a partnership. Uh, 40 of us are going to put up 20 grand. We're going to go buy this uh, land. And you say, Dean, what are we going to do on it? I said, we're going to sit on it. And as yeah. big as it grows, we're going to hope somebody's going to come and say they want to build apartments or build houses. or And then we flip it to them and we have a huge capital gain, we hope. You know, we hope. A new municipal bond has a dated date of January 1st, 2018. The first coupon was due August 1st, 2018. The customer bought for settlement on September 1st, 2018. How many months of accrued interest must, must they pay? Well, let's do your trick. 
Yeah, I don't know if we can do my, we can, try, we can try it. Let's try it. I'm just wondering if there's any tricks built into the question. We can't do it. So the trick would be to take settlement, right? So settlement is September 1st. If we're using the trick, that's going to be 9-1. Okay. And it says it has a dated date. The first coupon was due August 1st, 2018. And so that would be August would be 8-1. And if the trick works, it'll be, I think, one month. Is that what you get using the trick? Well, wait a minute. I thought it was eight months. Aren't we just taking Oh, that? no, no, no. Be careful. Be careful. Again, you got RTFQ. So it says the first coupon was due August 1st. So this was a J&J &J bond, but it said they had a long payment there. So they didn't pay the first interest payment until August 1st. Mm. So if you're using the trick, remember the trick on kind of interesting, Erica, I used to tell people not to worry about calculating this kind of thing, but they have some people have been telling me they've encountered this on the exam. But if you're going to use the trick, we're going to take settlement, which is nine one. Right, that's the trick, that's settlement. And then we're going to subtract from that the uh, last time the bonds paid interest. And the last time the bonds paid interest was August 1st. And when we do that, it's due. I messed up. Right. Then one from one is zero. And right. eight from nine is one month. And then we just got to know that every month is how many days? On a muni? Yep. On a corporate. Uh, it is 30 and 360. Yep. So it means the answer is B. Well, how to add write the question, Dean, I would have got it both times. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the other problem, by the way, people watching on the replay, please just rewind and do the shit record again. Don't start sending comments to, to show you this to you. Just rewind it and you know you can watch a couple of times at that point. If you want me to show you the trick, I'll do so. Uh, but yeah, the trick worked here. The trick works assuming again, though, that you paid attention to when the last time it paid interest, right? Mm -hmm. So the trick on this one was it wasn't J and J July, the first payment. This is called a long coupon where they don't pay that first coupon because they just, you know, the, the, we're, the syndicate, when we're selling the bonds, uh, can last several months while we're, we're trying to sell the bonds, you know, more than that. And we don't want to have to try and cut checks in the middle of a syndicate operation. All right. So let's see. So let's get rid of that. Which of the following is not uh, not considered when diversifying a municipal bond portfolio? The price. Yeah, excellent, excellent. You know, I always like to use one of my test taking tricks is called reduction to the ridiculous. What does the world look like if that is actually an answer? I mean, all the other ones make sense. Eric, I'm going to diversify you by quality. I'm going to get you some low quality, medium quality, high quality bonds to get your yield up. I'm going to diversify you by maturity. I'm going to have some short term, some medium term, some long term. We're going to have a rolling bond portfolio. So as we always have bonds coming due, we can revest at today's rate. Uh, Eric, I'm going to uh, do you diversify you geographically. I'm going to give you some urban areas of California some rural areas of California. I'm also going to give you some Puerto Rico. I'm going to diversify you geographically. All that makes sense. It doesn't make sense to say I'm going to diversify you with some cheap ones and some expensive ones. That would not make sense intellectually. Which of the following statements are true? An investor who expects no change in the stock price and which is to generate uh, income sells a straddle. An investor who expects no change in a stock's price buys a straddle. An investor who expects a substantial decline sells a straddle. An investor who expects substantial fluctuations in the stock price, but is unsure as direction buys a straddle. Four is true. Absolutely. I'm glad you got four because that's definitely, you know, why you do a straddle, right? So now you got on that, you got a 50-50, right? It's either B or D right? because you need four. So now you got to decide whether it's one or you got to decide whether it is uh Two. I would have used process of elimination here. Yeah, a, a, a short straddle is for stability, a long is for volatility. Yeah, that's right. And so, so that's right. So two is not makes that makes no sense. 
right? You don't buy a straddle if you expect no change in the stock price. So that means the answer has to be one and four. Now, I'm not a big fan of number one. I'm not so sure I'd say let's sell it at straddle for income. But yeah, you are going to get the premiums from the call and the put. Uh, stock price and the over-the-counter market are determined by, this is very testable. They're asking you to contrast the auction order-driven market with the over-the-counter markets. The major distinction is auction markets like New York are auction order-driven. Whereas over-the-counter markets are a public outcry. You have to do that. But is that for no, the no, 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 there's no, that's never going to be the right answer. We don't have any open <laughs> outcry securities marketplaces anymore. Okay. You should definitely know C is New York. If they would have asked you about auction, that's New York. C is New York. So B, uh, negotiation. That's right. I'm very testable. Uh, your margin account has a long market value of 10, a debit of three. And it would have. So you know how to set this up and do the mark? Yeah. Um, D. Uh, D, I haven't even, you're ahead of me again. <laughs> so, let's see if you got it right. I was just going to do it. I don't have any idea if you're right or wrong. So let's see. You're saying D. Oh, no. D for Dean. What's that? D for Dean. That's it. Okay, excellent. Man, you're ahead of your instructor. That's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, excellent. That's fantastic. Yeah, they're great. Uh, client, by, by the way, what I was getting ready to do is the initial setup in the market. And it sounds like you were you know, already ahead of me. Um, <laughs> if a client bought 100 shares at 88.50 on the same day and then went long at 40 put uh, for 425, what is the break even? I kind of like this one. You were pretty quick. This was another one earlier you were ahead of, of me on. So let's see if you're ahead of me on this one as well. I got 84.25. Well, I think you did a uh, something you should not do. Remember, this is a stock position. This is a oh, stock yeah. position, right? Maybe so the, the one time, the one time and the one time only, you're not going to be subtracting to get this. You're out 88.50 for the stock, right? You're out uh, four and a quarter for the protection. So it's going to be the stock cost plus the premium. The stock cost plus the premium, right? So I'm out a total of ninety two seventy five. So I I must have added that wrong because I tried to go up. Okay. As long as that's what you yeah. did. I yeah. went up first, but I I didn't get the number, so I <laughs> I went okay. down. Oh well, well, be and careful. That, yeah. But, uh, by the way, um, I you know as you know, I always say I use my calculator because my arithmetic skills are challenged. You don't want to, you don't want right. to when you know the arithmetic miss a question because you don't use a calculator so. Yeah, no break even. I'm usually spot on. I don't know what this was. A glitch in the matrix, maybe. I don't know. That's right. A customer sold 100 uh, shares of QRS short when the stock was trading at 19. Now it's at 14, and she wants to protect her gain. Which of the following orders would she place? Now, last time you were uh, had this question, you missed it. So let's see if this time you can redeem yourself. She's short stock. She's going to do a buy stop. Buy stop at. Oh, it doesn't even give you. Oh, um, yeah. Excellent. excellent. Stop it. Okay. Good job. Good job. Uh, many mutual fund investors elect to reinvest their dividends into additional shares. When an investor does this with the dividends paid by the common stock funds, and then you know, your choices are additional shares are purchased at public offering price. They're tax-free until the shares are sold. The investor's cost base is reduced. The uh, dividends are taxable. This is very much on the test. See. Yeah, this is called a drip and it's very testable. 
Uh, prompt disclosure of unintentional selective disclosures. So you're not allowed to make selective disclosures as a public company. And so uh, this is a violation of which of the following C. rules? What'd you say? C. Excellent, excellent. Uh, an investor short stock at 70, the stock's at 40. Uh, he anticipates it will decline, but to hedge against a rise in the price, the investor should, I expect you to get this right because you got this part of it right last time. You missed the type of order, but you didn't miss the appropriate option. You're gonna buy a call for protection. Uh, there you go, excellent, excellent. You're rolling, you're <laughs> rolling. You are asked to read the preliminary prospectus, red herring for a new issue. You would expect to include, so here's another one of these things about what's included, what's not included in a red herring. Remember last time we got asked this, the point was it doesn't have the public offering price. I don't know what the point is on this question, so let's uh, figure out what it says. The effective date of the offering and the risk associated with the offering, an overview of the history of the uh, uh, issuer's business and risks, an overview of the history of the investor's business and the final offering price, the effective date of the offering and the final offering price. You should expect to include. So I think you should have been able to eliminate C and D because we just said earlier, you don't have what in this thing? The final offering so price. Now you have a 50-50 based on knowing that it doesn't have the final offering price. Now, if this is a new, well, I guess you can have a history, but um, the effective date, you don't know the date until you pass the yeah, registration. Yeah, excellent, date. excellent. Excellent. An investor submits an immediate or cancel order to sell 800 shares at 3215. When the order reaches the floor, the quote is 3218, 3226, six by eight. So I say, Erica, right now in the auction, you can sell 600 shares at 3218. You can buy 800 shares at 3226. And you say, well, I want to sell. And I say, well, you want to sell. That means I have to match you with a buyer. You know, the 3218 is a seller and I need to match you with a buyer. And right now there is no buyer at 3215. And you're telling me that you want what you can get now and you want to cancel the balance. So I tell you, what do I tell you about your immediate cancel order? So was there any available here? Let's see, immediate cancel. So it's an immediate, to do, I'm just checking again. Investor sets to sell 100 share, 800 shares at 32.15. So you want to sell, I'm looking at the buy. This is a tough one. I, you know, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just looking through this. You're absolutely right. That's another one where you're a little ahead of Dean. I'm still trying to figure out which side of the bid I'm looking at. Uh, I know, me too. It's on my dump sheet. I have to remember five. You know, yeah, those are the stuff you got. Like I say, you've had a, uh, several that you're you know, ahead of me in terms of answering the question, right? <laughs> a senior official of an invest issuer learns that non-public information, uh-oh, was disclosed to an institutional shareholder of the issuer and analyst in a private meeting to avoid reg violating reg fd which is that selective disclosure question you got right what we do what do we do to fix it what do we do to fix it how do we fix a violation of reg fd d yeah, we're promptly going to disclose the information as soon as reasonably pr practical but right but in no event can we go 24 hours. Did you say A or D? D. It's actually, we're gonna do it to, on the trade, the next day's trading. So it's, yeah, yeah. but that, I don't think that they'd be that picky on your actual exam. So I'm gonna take that from, from it. That's a good answer. Which of the following uh, forms of soft dollar compensation to an investment advisor is not allowable? So this I is... gotta find this one, Dean, and go with B. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> By the way, it meets it meets two categories, Erica. It meets the B uh, thing, but it also is too long to be wrong. <laughs> too long. <laughs> too long to be wrong. Yeah. Uh, good job. Which of the line taxes are considered sources of debt service for special tax bonds? 
Oh, that there's the syntaxes I was looking for. That's right. These are those syntaxes. So two and three. Two and three. Excellent. <clears throat> A money market fund would be least likely to invest in which of the following assets? Notes. D. Right on. Good job. Uh, for a customer who's purchased stock and wants to write a call option, the option ticket would be marked. This answer set is very testable. Let's see. You have an opening purchase, so you need a closing sale. Or is it closing purchase? You need a closing purchase. Well, no, you remember. So you're on the stock. They're not asking about the stock. The stock is going to be an opening purchase to buy the stock. And it says you want to write a call. So the option ticket, now they're asking about the option order. Opening sale. There you go. Well, that answer set is very testable. Uh, in a restricted margin account, a sale of 5,000 of stock would create. In a restricted margin account, sell the 5,000. What that means? That means you're below 50%. And the restriction is that you can only have half the proceeds when you're in a restricted account. So restricted is below 50%. And now you sell. And I, as a margin clerk, say, Erica, because you're restricted, you're below 50, the restriction is I can only send you $2,500. And you said, geez, you know, that doesn't sound well. But I tell you what, Erica, if you leave the 5000 in the account, I will credit you for the $2,500 you could have got and chose not to. This is the one time and the one time only that there's going to be an SMA entry that is not a function of mark to market. I'm going to give you a special memorandum of your accounts that on today, Erica, you could have had $2,500 from that 5000 but you didn't take it. It's the one time and the one time only there's going to be a credit for the half you could have had. Are there any other time the SMA is created by your high water mark on the stock? So this is kind of a trick. I wouldn't worry about this at all. All test prep vendors go way overkill on margin. Way yeah. overkill. Uh, fill or kill order. Fill or kill order. One and three. Uh, C. Boom, boy, you're good on the orders. I thought you wanted to load orders. I, well, I, again, I was just going to say, I don't know why you seem pretty good on it, but you did have that. We were wobbly uh, on only one question on orders where you wobbly, and it was that sell stop versus the buy stop on the short position. Other than that, you've been pretty solid on the order questions you've been encountering. So an investor opens a long position of one XYZ, November 40 call, call at seven on the settlement date, the investor. Mm -hmm. Uh, D. Well, how'd you get 14 grand? That's a bad miss. It's the premium, right? So it says an investor opens a long position. Now, if you exercise that contract, Erica, that would be T plus two and you would owe $14,000. But they're asking about the option contract. In the option contract, you just have to pay the premium. Yeah. So, yeah, not a bad, you know, not a bad miss, but. Had that asked about the exercise, you would have been correct. If I say, if the investor exercises, then you'd have to come up with 14 grand and that would be T plus two. And this is T plus one. Uh, I wasn't expecting that miss from you, to be honest with you. I wasn't expecting you to miss that. Um, break even is 157, unlimited gain, maximum loss is seven and you're bullish on the stock, right? All the following mortgage are, are issue mortgage-backed securities except. Thanks. Right on. Good job. Excellent. So I think you did that pretty good on uh, your <laughs> 60 questions. You went way over your 30 minute phone call, but I told you your coaching call that you won. You finally won the <laughs> coaching call. Uh, but like I say, you're a loyal person and I uh, appreciate all the uh, suggestions you've made to me on how to improve everybody else's experience uh, with our channel and what we do. 
And so I'm not uh, uh, worried at all that uh, we ran over uh, to an hour and a half, but uh, we got your 60 questions on. I would tell you that I'm pretty pleased with a couple things. The things you know, you know well. So I'm really glad about that. And then uh, the things you're wobbly on, you know, just trust yourself. Because I told you, I think you know even more than you demonstrate sometimes in doing practice questions. And trust your flash response. And remember that the, the B trick is only to be used in the last resort. So <laughs> I don't want you to be guessing B all the time because we I mean, wear a lot of Bs. Any other things for me? We also remember you have your office hour that we share. Uh, Perfect. Today. So, you know, whatever you else you want to get handled, that would be another time frame to do that. Okay. Anything else for um, me? How'd you feel? How'd I, you feel like you did? I felt like I did. Well, I hate to have any messes, but better to get the kinks off with you than on the actual exam. Always, um, always. I wish people could embrace that because that is exactly correct. It doesn't cost you anything to miss practice questions. And sometimes people, you know, they, I don't know, I, I kind of get it. They don't want to get negative feedback, but you need it. You need it. And so I told you, even, even in your first testing victory, I, I, you know, I find you to be very resilient. I know it's frustrating when you're not uh, getting, you know, the, the scores you'd like to get, but you just got to keep, keep working. And you, you, you know, I, I know you get frustrated sometimes, but you keep working. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that that's going to pay some dividends for you on your actual time. You're going to get your second testing victory. And then we, then we only have to worry about one more, right? And then you'll you be done. <laughs> so be careful. Uh, I'm, I'm not being facetious with you. Don't work too hard because uh, I don't want you wearing yourself out before your test date, right? So, you know, you need to kind of, kind of be winding down and make sure you get a good night's rest and, you know, keep it low key. Um, uh, practice test scores, are they where we want them to be? Are you in that uh, 70 range? Or are you in the, a little below 60? Where are you, what are you pulling on practice tests? I'm right below 70 with Kaplan. Okay, I think that's going to be okay because you're going to pick up Kaplan jerks or bigger jerks than the real jerks. So I expect you to pick up at least a few points. So I think we're you're going to be fine. I've had people get as low as 58 on Kaplan wow. pass. I wouldn't count on it. I mean, between 60 and 70, you know, there's still a, a little bit of a risk factor. But uh, most of the risk factors with a high 60 aren't associated with knowledge deficit. They're associated mm -hmm. with other things that put you at risk, like, you know, changing answers or, you know, not trusting your, your own confidence and then your answers, uh, you know, as you get that flash response, those little things we talked about. And then, you know, making sure you get all you're entitled to, all you're entitled to. You only had two, a couple misses where I thought, oh, man. Erica's entitled to that one. I don't know how she didn't get that one. But that was only a couple of times. Most of the time, like I say, I was very impressed. In fact, what was it? Four or five times you were ahead of me in getting the right answer. So, you know, <laughs> so that hopefully, that'll, you know, you'll get a good draw. You know, uh, you certainly deserve a dream draw. So let's hope you get one, right? So you get a lot of those aim and shoot point and click questions. Thank you, Dane. I okay. appreciate it. All right. All right. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. You want, uh, we did record this. You want a copy? It'll be on the channel, but uh, I would worry yep. about you time on things so you probably got other things to do between now and your test day yeah but late in the wee hours rather than emailing you i can be watching this okay video. all right i'll send you i'll send you your own personal copy perfect thank you okay. dear. you bet bye-bye bye-bye okay.